Hello everyone and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration and this is series 4 of our playthrough and that means we're going to be going out and exploring deep space and trying to do uh, all kinds of complicated deep space science and stuff like that. But first, there's a, there's a few things to look at. Top of the list is that, well, unfortunately Mark isn't able to join us for at least this part of the series because he's off gallivanting around the world or something. And so he, um, before he left, he did leave us a little bit of a surprise and a present. And this all started off with this poem over here that he's written in, 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 in space. In the vast expanse Mark let his course to soar. To deep space mysteries he'd explore and explore. But among the stars he found no guiding trace, lost in cosmic whispers a solitary embrace. In the tapestry of stars, his path now intertwined, each visited locale, a clue he'd left to bind. To unearth his location in this boundless cosmic place, at the heart of cherished destinations one can trace. Yeah, so riddles and excitement and confusion and lots of and I spent so I spent a little while during the uh, during the stream trying trying to puzzle my way through this. To start with, we discovered that they uh, by the crash spaceship on Norvis, where the whole thing started, that um, there was this chest here. Uh, not no, actually it's not a chest; it's a combinator, but with an obvious label saying that Mark has hidden a treasure. So I had I took a look at this. And it turned out it was um, for as it was an asteroid belt 50. So a little bit of research into that and allowed me to to work out that asteroid belt 50 is in fact Kalida's asteroid belt 2. You can see over here the automation signal is asteroid belt 50. So that was that was quite easy. So I decided let's go out there, let's have a look. And so I did. I flew all the way out to Kalida's asteroid belt 2, poked around a bit, had a look, and when it flipped over to the map view, had a bit of an explore around here, and. As far as I can tell, there is there is nothing here that was of, of relevance. So um, that was a little bit, little bit of a disappointment is too strong a word, but it uh, it made it made it look like I wasn't I I obviously I clearly missed something. I was barking up the wrong asteroid belt at this point. So back to the clues. Hmm. The next clue we I, I took a look at was the each visited locale a clue he'd left to mind. So with that that led to thinking about places where Mark had been. And so in the solar system we have a, a few locations that he was very heavily responsible for. So one was Kalidas orbit where he went out to set up all of the uh, all of the beam um, weapons and things over there. And he'd also been out to Taras and Bigrid these to the uh, moon and planet out this way. So uh, yeah these these all seemed worth exploring. So first off I went out to Bigrid and uh, this was this was a relatively easy one. Uh, we see in X marks the spot, and there is a, a another combinator here with uh, a t twenty-five thousand. It will to look slightly more precisely twenty-five thousand eight hundred fifty-six. So we've got an X, an X number here. In, that was interesting. Kalidas orbit was a little bit more of a disappointment. I sort of I had a bit of a scout around this area, and whilst we do have some stuff built up out here, and all the solar panels and all these beams that were zapping out at various places around the system. In fact, I think I think I worked out they're basically all attacking Norvis at this point, killing, trying to kill off some more of the biters and make the planet a little bit safer for us. But there didn't seem to be anything else here. So the next place to look was Taras, and this is the planet where we've been getting all the Imosite from, and this is going quite nicely, so I had a look around so by, the, by the space elevator again, and the, there didn't seem to be anything here, but it's also notable that the, the very centre of the planet is actually down over here, so that's a much more important, much more relevant place to look. And here we have a number with uh, a number of Y. This is uh, minus sixteen thousand six hundred seventy-eight. From this, I jumped to jump to a conclusion uh, that uh, an X number and a Y number and a location. Well, let's put all three of those together and go back out to Kalida's asteroid belt two. And if we zoom out a bit, if I ping somewhere, you can see down there in the bottom corner of the screen, we've got we've got the coordinates, so 808, 75. So if I move a bit further over this way and up a bit, then we've got minus 5,000, minus 900. So it's sort of somewhere out this way. And after a bit of rummaging around like this, I did finally, I, I find, I did finally find an area. Um, well, it was, it was, it was here. Um, and and what we found there was a spaceship. And it didn't look quite like this when I first got to it. I have to admit. Um, the so you can see here we've got a ghost of a high temperature heat exchanger. There was also a ghost of one of the high temperature turbines next to it. The really advanced ones. Um, and these have been put in as ghosts because whilst we've researched them, we haven't managed to actually start making them yet. There's still a few um, intermediates that are required that we that we aren't making. However, I did manage to park my spaceship right next to it, and that meant I could then drop down some. Um, I could then pull up the. I pulled up one. I deleted one of the ghosts and sacrificed some of the um, some of the solar panels from my spaceship to put them in here. So this would have a small amount of power. The energy beam receiver is, as you can see, already heated up to ten thousand degrees C. But there's not a huge amount I could do with that. I could have brought some water out, and I could have put it through the regular heat exchangers and then used these these turbines, these condenser turbines over here, to uh, to to get the sh ship moving. But I decided better just drop in some solar panels and let it drift very back very very slowly. And my plan was that I thought, well, 
I mean, I, I could just leave it there and then try and build the uh, the um, heat exchanger and the turbine and bring them out to it, put, fit, fit them to it, try and pump some water into it, that sort of thing, get it, get it working that way, and then fly it back gloriously at full speed. But actually, we decided, um, and by we, I mean myself and chat, uh, decided it'd be much more interesting to put just put the solar panels in and let it see how it got on. So we then told it to set off, and it was drifting through space at a speed of about one, claiming somewhere in the region of eight hours in order to get all the way back to Norvis orbit. However, of course, as it got closer in, if you look at the solar system, Kalidas Astro Belt 2 is all the way out here, so the solar panels don't work all that well. If we click on it, you can see we're getting 20% uh, solar out here. But then as you get further and further in, if you get to Kalidas Astro Belt 1, then you're getting 172%. When you get to Norvis orbit, you're getting 466%. So you're getting a lot more power, about 23 times as much, in fact. And so the ship gradually sped up and sped up and sped up on the way back in. And as you can see here, it actually reached Norvis orbit before I managed to build up all the bits and pieces that I was planning to take back out to it. So um, yeah, the, uh, the ship quite clearly won the race there. And so yes, this ship is going to be very, very useful for sort of deep space exploration. So this is going to be the sort of the deep space equivalent of these sort of ships that we've been using to fly around the solar system. So we, these ones, are, these ones are great because we can use them to fly around the solar system with the Vine. They've got enough solar to generate enough power to run the four ion engines, keep them going. They can land on small planets. They can carry lots of stuff. But this ship is entirely self-contained. It's got its own power source in the form of this um, heat, heat battery here, which will allow it to fly enormously long distances because you can store a huge amount of power in those things. And it's got a lot more engines, so it can fly a lot faster, which means not only will it be good for going around the solar system, but we can also then ex escape and go interstellar with it and go out to maybe maybe different solar star systems, maybe off to, uh, off to the various asteroid fields. Basically, we've got so much more freedom with these ships that we can take them a lot further and go explore a lot further, go out looking for Naquium and maybe and other exotic resources like copper which we don't have a primary for in this in our solar system. The one thing it's lacking at the moment, well no there's there's, there's several things it's lacking at the moment. Um, it's obviously lacking the heat exchanger and the turbine which we, which need which will fit in here very very nicely and that'll allow it to fly a bit more. Uh, we'll need to then refuel all of these tanks across here with ion stream as you can see there's a tiny tiny amount in it after I, after I topped it up from my ship to, to give it enough fuel to fly it back to um, back to Norbit. It's also going to need to be given quite a lot of water to go into the tank here in in order to keep the ship flying from bet between places and to make it useful we're also going to need to put a load of chests in probably across here in the middle uh, just to give it a load of extra storage container space allowing us to take stuff with us and so we can build things when we get there it's not going to be any good for actually bringing back large quantities of Naquim. It's not a hauler, but then, nor is this ship. This, this ship is designed as a personal ship. It's designed to get me places quickly. If I want to haul stuff, then we use these sort of ships. And so we'll presumably, we'll, we'll end up making a design that's sort of a cross between the two. In fact, maybe we'll make one that is exactly like this, except in the bottom here, it has this sort of setup with the tanks and the, um, and, and, and the, and the energy beam receiver and so on. So we can get, so we can get the ship to fly much more reliably uh, in interstellar and that'll be that'll be very exciting and so thank you very much to uh, to mark for building all this building this uh, ship up for us and also creating an entertaining little uh, riddle and scavenger hunt treasure hunt thing for uh, for, for me to to, to to it occupied me for um, a chunk of the stream while while I went off to find it so that, that was good fun and so that brings me on to trying to make the bits and pieces to finish off that ship uh, the first thing in the list is we need we need the high temperature heat exchanger and in order to make that we need nanomaterial heavy composite pressure vessel space pipe and heat shielding and now some of this isn't a problem the heavy composites are being made on Norvis in decent quantities at least when we have a decent amount of iridium and they're probably somewhere on this on, on this belt here already I wouldn't be surprised we've got the iridium there we've got the iridium girders here I don't see heavy composites actually, but to be honest, that's not a problem. They're going to be—it's going to be easy to add them on and bring them in. That—that's absolutely fine. The space pipes are being are on on the system already down here. Yes, here we go. Here's a here's a belt with space pipes on it. So I just need to extend this one all the way up to the top, which it pretty much is. Which is nearly there already. So that's going to be easy. Heat shielding is here on this belt, so that's going to be absolutely fine. For the pressure vessels, well, Mark actually made those last week, and um, I don't remember talking about that. So if I, if I didn't mention it at all, then I apologise. And if I did mention it and I'm talking about it again uh, excessively now, then I guess I apologise for that as well. So the pressure vessels are made from um, aeroframe bulkhead, beryllium plates, chemical gel, and methane gas. So those are all things that we have in fairly easy access to around here. And the machine has now built up a a load of them along the belt here and, and stopped running, which is pretty normal. My biggest concern with these is the methane gas because we don't have an, an infinite, we don't have a sort of a, a stable supply of that yet. 
At the moment, it's being generated as a byproduct of one of the stages of the um, vitamelange processing down here. So when we when we when we turn the vitamelange bloom into mostly vitamelange spice, it also releases a bit of methane as well, and we're capturing that. It's coming up the pipe over here, being fed into this tank. Um, and now, in theory, we're then freezing that with cryonite uh, or cryonite slush because we need the acid as well, and turning it into methane ice, which then gets shipped off to Norvis. So we do have some of it. We've, we've got we do have a bit of a supply available, but. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, we've run out of cryonite here, so we've we've stopped capturing it um, because it was being delivered by delivery cannon, which is not a thing we want to do anymore. So we need to start putting it onto the spaceship that bring, that comes out to Big Red in order to unload it, in order to turn it into uh, in order to turn it into slush to make the methane ice and yada yada yada. That all then gets shipped all the way back to Norvis, where it gets sorted out of the junk system over here and passed over into this station. And as you can see, we've got quite a bit of it at the moment. There's thirty thousand in the warehouse, and then there's another uh, thirty-two thousand in the train. So we've got nearly two trains worth available to us. And there seems to be some of it coming up this pipe here, and I'm not quite sure where this comes from. Let's have a quick look. Um, okay, so there, ah, I see. There's a supply. There is a supply of methane ice coming in here on the bus. Great. That's how. That's how I would expect things this to happen. Going into here and then being passed up here as, as the gas. So presumably that means if it's on the bus down here, presumably that means that we've had that Mark has put a, an extra request on the system. Yes, there we go. We're asking for methane ice, and presumably, presumably that means yes. Over here we have a supply of methane ice being fed in. And if we follow this back, and no doubt we'll find that it's coming in on one of the trains down here. This looks faintly familiar, and the fact it's here rather than the last one on the, in, the, in all of the columns makes me wonder if perhaps it was already there. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, that means we have the methane we need up here, and that's allowing us to make the lattice pressure vessels, which means we've got them out on the list here. The one remaining thing to make for the high temperature heat exchangers is nanomaterial, and that requires quite a lot of stuff. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but before I do, let's take a quick look at the high temperature turbine generator. And that requires a similar sort of array of things, but it's actually slightly worse. So we've got the heat shielding and the space pipe and the lattice pressure vessel, they're all fine. We've talked about those, we've, we've got all of those nearby, that's, that's okay. Heavy assemblies are being made down on Norvis, although I don't think we're shipping them up here in significant quantities yet, so we'll need to make sure we start getting those. Nanomaterials, I've said I'll come back to those and I mean it. Holmium solenoids, uh, yep, yeah, there they are on that, on that belt there, so that one's fine. Superconductive cables, I don't think are over here yet. However, that was one of the things I started making as part of the matter science down here. So we've got quite a lot of the uh, superconductive cables being produced. And I say quite a lot, it's actually only, it's barely enough to keep this system running. So that's problematic. I was planning to leech off some of these and stick them into a train over here so they could be taken away to wherever they're needed. But we seem to be churning through quite a bit of the, um, somehow, we, despite the fact that we've got, we've filled up this warehouse here. And this has been, this was full in the, in the videos from the last stream. It seems that we are still making the, um, the microwave bacon data over here and quite a bit of that's coming through and yeah, we are still building it, which is a little bit of a surprise, but okay then, I guess. Um, I suppose we'll let that run and at least, we've got, at least we've got a suitable backlog of it available. Maybe we did a load of science that required the matter science uh, packs and so we, we, we've had another train load go through. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there were quite a lot in here. Yeah, that's, gone, they, that's a lot fewer than there were before. So I reckon, the, um, the yes, we, we've used quite a lot of these. So the system is running as it, as it, as it should. However, I think we might need quite a lot more of these than we're currently getting. This doesn't look like as many as I've been hoping for. Whether I'm going to need to start making these somewhere else, or whether we're going to just sort of somehow cope, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, or maybe I'll just make this much, 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 much longer and just start making the uh, making the superconductive cables here in, in significantly larger quantities. We've already got all of these machines running full of speed module 3s everywhere where we can, and yet they're still getting used up pretty quickly, so that is, is a little bit of a concern. But that means we've now, yeah, we've got everything in here is sort of solved. The superconductor cables are a little bit of a problem, but everything else is essentially sorted in that we've got, we know we know where it's being made at the very least. So then we get onto nanomaterial, and nanomaterial is going to be a bit of a mission because there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. So looking at the list here, we want thermo supercooled thermofluid. That's that's fine. We know we know how to deal with that. You just bring in, you use the standard um, system up here for cooling. You bring in thermofluid. You cool it down to cool, then to cold, then to super chilled. That's absolutely fine. We know how to do that. Then you need particle stream. That's not a problem. We're generating that over here in the cloud storage area, so we've got loads and loads of particle stream being made here, fed into the tanks. We've got loads of it. It can just be t it can just turn up by train. Fine. Vitalic epoxy is slightly complicated because it's one of the uh, biologicals 
Um, and, the, and, and because Mark set up the train system for that, I don't fully understand it. Um, but essentially, we've got, if we look in here, you can see we've got lots and lots of Vitalik Epoxy. There's 4,000 in that warehouse, another 4,000 in that one, and another 4,000 in that one. So we're doing pretty well for the Vitalik Epoxy. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, I, think I, I think I can get that to turn up. Aeroframe bulkheads and heavy composites are being made en masse down on Norvis and can be just shipped up in any train that wants them. Those, those are easy, we just need to put in a train for them. Dynamic emitters. Now, dynamic emitters are a problem because we're not making them anywhere. So, um, or at least we're not making them anywhere in quantity. So let's have a look at this. This requires um, holmium solenoids. Now, again, those aren't a problem. That's another thing that's being made en masse down on Norvis. Chuck it in the train, it can get brought up. Um, particle stream we've already talked about, imosite crystals and cryonite rods, those are being brought in by spaceship from other places, so we've got from Snowdrop we're bringing in lots and lots of cryonite as you can see here, and from Taras we're bringing in uh, immersion plate and imosite crystals, but we seem to have run out of imosite crystals, but in theory those are being brought over by the spaceship, so that should be okay, and when they do they get brought down to Norvis, we can then mix it all together, bring it up in a train, fine. Quantum processors, these are a little bit tricky and I think I'll come back to those because I've been saying that all this stuff is going to come up in a train and so in order to get that I've put in an additional train down here, down on the surface of Norvis and this fills up with all the bits and pieces that you could put, that, that I've been talking about. So in here you can see we've got the uh, we've got the heavy composites, the aeroframe bulkheads, the imosite crystals, there were some it turns out, the cryonite rods and the holmium solenoids and that's being fed in by exactly the same system that you're, 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 used, you're used to seeing from everywhere else. So we've got all these belts coming in with those different things and they're all coming off the bus down here. The only complicated part of this, I think, was that I had to put in a load of landfill here in order to get these ingredients in because there wasn't any land, or there was just a load of water in the way, and then so I just had to had to bring the belts across. But that was that wasn't hard at all. So we've got all of those things. They're all pretty straightforward, and then they need to go somewhere. So up in Norbit, we we had a bit of a look at the uh, look at the design of the space station at the moment, and thought where would be a good place to put this. So the my first thought was well, let's just continue on along this way as 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 we have been, and that would mean in theory that would mean the next the next um, out post would, would go up here straight through the middle of the secondary elevator um, but that's fine we could just move it a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right there's no way Mike's going to make this any bigger surely <laughs> at least at least in width so that probably probably be fine but then I thought actually no let's have it a bit closer to the elevator because it takes forever to stuff get for stuff to get over here and whenever you're building over here you always end up wait you, you put down a blueprint or something and you wait half an hour for the bots to bring over the scaffolding from here or all the way over and then you put down the rest of the design and then you have to wait another half hour for the bots to bring stuff from the column of construction over here to actually build what you're looking for so instead decided that coming over here and building opposite module city would be a good idea so this down here is the start of an area that's going to be making the um, the nanomaterials and then after that the plan is for this to turn into another science spike so we've got uh, what, what have we got we've got energy here we've got astro here we've got bio here we've got modules over here we've got actual science here materials up here matter down on the bottom of energy and a spaceport over here Oh, and the cloud stuff in the middle here as well, and recycling, and, and, and so on. So we thought, actually, let's stick this over here, opposite module, the module area, and we can have deep space science heading out all the way down here and make that as big as it needs to be. Because if I'm building on the left of the side, side of, the, um, of, the, of the rails, which I am, as you can see here, then we've got literally an infinite amount of space to play with. Because I think in, uh, in space, you, there is, unlike on the planets where you have a limited size, in space you can actually go forever. So, yeah, we should have just about enough room for deep space science over there, I expect. And so I copy and pasted the thermofluid cooling area over from uh, from from the Astro Science because that's the biggest one and therefore and the one that I've tweaked and modernised the most. So as you can see here, it's it's all using tier two modules. That's kind of fun. He given us saying how modern it was and normal beacons as well. So that's um, yeah, I obviously did a load of upgrading on that, but quite a long time ago. Um, and also the uh, the drop-off station for the thermofluid over here as well. And you might notice that even though all this is built up and I've named the station and it's got a train limit and all that sort of stuff is set up, we're not actually getting any thermofluid through. And that is because over here in the thermofluid area, we had a problem. Making thermofluid requires quite a lot of different things. As you see, we need we need sulfur, we need iron, copper, heavy oil, and chemical gel. Now, chemical gel is being made here. Sulfur and iron and so on are being brought in. Now, the sulfur has run out, but that wasn't the problem that we we're having before. So previously, 
we were getting the oil from the scrap processing area up here. So when you crush down scrap, you get out an, an array of, um, well, you get a chance of getting out an array of various different ores, and there's also a chance you'll get out some heavy oil as well. And part of me, I have to admit, thinks that the reason you're, you're, you get some heavy oil out of this recycling is to make it a little bit more difficult and to give you a fluid to deal with as well. So you can't just chuck it all on belts like this and send it away. Uh, but we've been, we've been we're okay, we're okay with that really. So we've been just dumping that down, down this um, pipe down here, and it's been coming down all the way down here to be turned into thermofluid. Great. The problem is, crushing scrap doesn't actually produce all that much oil, so while we weren't looking, it had run out completely. Now previously we had a big stockpile of it in barrels that we've been bringing up before we had the space elevator, and so we had a load of it and we've been working through that, and that's why we hadn't noticed for quite a long time that we were running so low on thermofluid. But we finally got through all of that and, the, and, and it's become a problem, shall we say. So, in order to get around that, I've dropped in this station here, which is which is asking for heavy oil. This is the only place where we have a heavy oil station in in space. But somebody else, and I suspect probably Tristan. Let's see if let's see if we can tell. Uh, yes, Tristan set up set up systems for all of the all of the fluids to be brought up to space. So we had a train that was sitting here. It had its station. It had all of the everything set up, except it just didn't have anywhere to drop the heavy oil off. So it was nice and easy for me to fix it, get that working, and get it bringing the bringing the heavy oil over to here, where it's now being dropped off, and then passed into a into into a system here. And in order to keep the uh, the levels right and to try and prevent any sort of failure down the line, I've got this pump here set to run whenever there's less than 10,000 in the tank. So this will push through whenever there's less than 10,000 and th this cable runs all the way down to the, the both the tanks down here. So 10,000 means it's 20% full. So it's, it's not keeping it brimming but it's keeping it enough in there that the system will run. As you can see we've now got 11,000 in and that's because the oil is still flowing through from the um, from the uh, scrap processing. So I, do, I wanted to make sure there's plenty of headroom for that to fill up, fill up and allow that to keep running. Just in case we ever get to a point where we're not making thermofluid um, because we've, we've got enough of it, because it's a thing that mostly gets recycled, you only get through a relatively small amount of it. Um, but with scrap processing is something that is endless, that's always happening. So there is a chance that will always, that will fill up and we'll have more than we know what to do with. And if that does happen, we've, we've got this pump here which watches for it being over 40,000, which is, uh, what, 80% full. And if that happens, it'll pump it down in this extra pipe over here, which runs over to these two chemical, well, biochem facilities, which will then crack it down into petroleum gas which we have many many more uses for and are probably going to be able to get rid of without any difficulties. And so we reckon this should be a good way of getting rid of any excess whilst making sure that the thermofluid always has some heavy oil available to allow it to get made. Now we do clearly have a problem here with the with the sulfur coming through. So previously this hasn't been an issue because there's been so many different things being brought up by this train that we haven't run into the problem of running out of one of the things um, because it was bringing up it was bringing up all the rough data substrates to make all of the memory cards and that was something that was under really really heavy demand. It was also bringing up the copper and iron ingots that are also being used to make the thermofluid and in the case of the copper to make the memory cards as well and a, and a few other random bits and pieces. So this train was running basically all the time. It was running constantly, trying to just trying desperately to keep up with the uh, the demand on these data substrates. However, we now amazingly seem to actually have enough. This whole system has gone to sleep. We've got, um, I don't know how many, we've got, we've got um, 300 stacks, almost 15,000 memory cards in here. Um, and the, and this, this, this belt over here uh, only runs when there's less than 7,000 in the two combined. So we literally have twice as many as required in order for that to, to trigger. So we, uh, we have an embarrassment of memory cards at the moment, although I am slightly curious as to why the train isn't here. Oh, it's on its way back. That's fine. It's just, it's just been busy. That, that, that is acceptable. And so, yeah, we have loads and loads of memory cards. We're not making them at the moment. So, yeah, we don't have that great demand on the on this train. So I think we're just going to have to put in a very large request for sulfur here. Instead of asking for 3,500, we're going to have to ask for, like, 8,000 or something like that. And that will then cause the train down on Norvis to fill up and bring it up here. Alternatively, I could put in the system that triggers it to uh, set off up here if, and if if you get down to actually zero of any of the things it's looking for. That might be more sensible, to be honest. I'll probably uh, Maybe I'll switch that over in the next stream because this, this, this sort of thing is a problem. And just increasing these numbers will eventually cause issues as well because you eventually get to the point where you're asking for an entire train's worth of each of the things that comes in and then you realise you've overfilled your warehouse and think everything's just going to break, it's not going to work, everything goes wrong. 
And so over here, my cunning plan is starting to come together. We have the drop-off station here for all the solids. So you can see those the, the five things I was talking about earlier have all been brought up. So we're ready to start trying to make those into into the dynamic emitters, and then after that into the nanomaterials. So that's going quite well. And we've got the we've got the pink clouds here, and we've also got the vitalic epoxy and the uh, quantum processors coming in. And these ones, I, I I cheated a little bit. I copied and pasted stations that already existed. So if we look up here on the on the space bus, there are stations along here for dropping off quantum processors, and I think there's one for vitalic epoxy. No, there isn't one for Vitalik Epoxy. Somewhere, somewhere there is a train dropping off Vitalik Epoxy. I, I can't remember exactly where. So I copied. The, so I just copied the stations that were that were already set up, already working. Because as I say, they're slightly complicated train systems. I didn't want to fiddle with them too much in case they broke. But this seems to be working. And it seems that the way they work, at least this this one works by um, by monitoring the amount, the number of quantum processes in here when it gets to. Um, that should be a less than or equal to. I'll need, I'll need to fix that, otherwise we'll never see another train. Um, but it, yeah, when, when there's less than 100 um, uh, quantum processors in here, then it'll call for another train, the train will come out, it'll unload at least some quantum processors. And the way it calls for it is by putting a quantum processor signal onto this network. And that means when the uh, there's a train somewhere around that's looking for out for that signal, and when it's easy, it goes, aha, somebody wants quantum processors, and it heads over and drops them off here. Um, it doesn't just run on a normal schedule because of reasons that I'm not going to get into because I'll probably quote it wrongly and then get, and get myself in trouble. And so that's, yeah, with those two, those are the other two things that, have been, that needed to be brought in. And now I believe, at least once the thermofluid arrives, I believe I've now got everything I could possibly want in order to make the nanomaterials. I just need to put in the infrastructure. So that's going to be pretty much job one for the next stream, I think. And oh, there's good timing. The, uh, the the train of thermofluid has just arrived, so we can uh, now start that f that uh, pouring out into the tanks here. It'll come across here, go into all of these radiators, pour along all along the systems here, and we can start actually cooking the uh, not cooking, chilling the thermofluid down to the level I need. Now I'm pretty sure the only one I actually need is the super chill that comes out over here, and then of course the return pipe that brings the warm stuff back again to go back into the system. But I've put but we've got all the pipe work in over here just in case we just in case we need something else later, or just in case the deep space science does some causes some sort of shenanigan and so i'm going to keep this 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 path down here completely free and it, just for the thermofluids then this one is this one over here is obviously going to be for these things because they're already poking out of the warehouse when i realize i need some more solids i'll have another couple of warehouses over here i guess and then we've got another two space spaces down here so that's room for another 10 belts for anything that i haven't thought of because there's bound to be something isn't there and you know what i think that brings us to the end of the things i wanted to talk about in this first episode so i hope this is uh, this has been interesting you're looking forward as much as i am to seeing all of the uh, the deep space science stuff as we as we gradually eke our way out there into the into the uh, depths of deep space i did have a look around a couple of the nearby asteroid fields and i think solar and, and tralis looks a bit rubbish there's very very little aquatite there Stardust looks a bit better, so I had a quick look at this one, and it started off looking kind of disappointing, because I started over here and went, okay, well, we've got half a million there, most of a million there, this isn't looking amazing, oh, well, there's 1.4 million over there, that's not too bad. Then I went a bit the other way, and found that, okay, we've got 5 million there, 3 million there, 1 million there, and and then I guess the half million over there. So if we start set up some sort of facility in the middle here to deal with it all, I think this is going to do us quite nicely. There's even little bits of little bits of other things around, I think, including some water ice down there that could be incredibly useful. Um, we've got iron and copper and uranium. So, so yeah, I think this, this could be quite a good place to come to. It's also possible this ephemeral expanse might be a bit closer, but there's not very much naquitite here, so we're probably less likely to go to that one. So I think Stardust is going to be our deep space base where all the naquium is going to come from. And I've not even I've not really properly looked at the naquium recipe yet, mostly because I daren't. It's going to terrify me. <laughs> um, so one one step at a time. Let's get a spaceship that can go out there and then start thinking about what we need to take with us and how we're going to harvest all of the all the glorious naquium and and how much of a headache it's going to be to actually get some brought back to Norvis. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. And so if you come along on Thursday, you'll be able to watch me carrying on with trying to make the nanomaterials over here and uh, watching Tristan and Mike getting on with all kinds of other stuff as well. On Tuesday, I shall be carrying on with the satisfactory streams. And of course, Saturday and Monday will be these catch-up videos that you're watching at the moment so you already know about. I want to try and get around to making more Wednesday videos as well. This is the little Factorio bonus videos where I talk about mods or builds or that sort of thing. I've got quite a few ideas. I've just been struggling a little bit with time. So those will be coming uh, just... We, as and as and when I have time to do them, so keep an eye out for those as well because they tend to be they tend to be very good as well. So thanks once again for watching, and I hope I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.